it looked uh, practically was that between the second and the third hour when my experience was culminating, a research assistant came and said it was time to drive the brain waves. So she took me to a little cell, uh, I lay down, she pasted the electrodes on my head, asked me to close my eyes and then brought this gigantic strobe, put it above my head and turned this thing on. And in the next moment there was light like I had never seen in my life couldn't even imagine existed. Um, my first idea was this must have been like what it looked like in Hiroshima when the bomb went off. Today I think it was more like the Dharmakaya, the, the primary clear light from the Tibetan Book of the Dead that we're supposed to see at the moment of death. Uh, my consciousness was catapulted out of the body, I lost the connection with the body. I lost the research assistant, I lost the clinic, I lost Prague, then I lost the planet. And then I had the feeling my consciousness had absolutely no boundaries. Uh, and when she was following very carefully the protocol, you know, going from, from two cycles to 60, back, then leaving it for a while in the middle of the alpha, then the theta, then uh, the delta uh, range. And then she turned it off. And as she was doing it, I had this you know, incredible uh, cosmic type of experience of cosmic consciousness. And then when she turned it off, uh, my consciousness started to shrink again. I found the planet, I found Prague, I found my body. And after a while, I managed to align my consciousness uh, with my body again. And I was very impressed what just had happened to me. <laughs> and I thought, well, I thought I'm stuck with psychiatry. So this by far is the most interesting thing you can do when you are a psychiatrist, study non-ordinary states of consciousness. So for the last, it's now 45 years, I have really done very little else professionally, but something that was in one way or another related to these non-ordinary states. Uh, about half of the time uh, was clinical research with psychedelics in the research institute in Prague and then at uh, the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center where for a few years I was heading the last surviving uh, psychedelic research in the United States. Uh, the second half, uh, my wife Christina and I developed the holotropic breathwork where you can induce powerful non-ordinary states using very simple means like faster breathing, some evocative uh, music and a certain kind of body work. I had a lot of contact with anthropologists. Uh, I spent some time with shamans. I participated in uh, various ceremonies. Of, uh, native uh, cultures uh, in, with peyote, with uh, mushrooms, with uh, uh, ayahuasca. Uh, I did some work with people who had near-death experiences. We also had one of the studies we did at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center was work with people uh, who had terminal cancer facing death. Um, so working with people with near-death experiences uh, and having contact with uh, thanatologists, uh, doing some work with people with UFO abduction experiences, some of the people studying uh, uh, these kinds of uh, experiences, in contact with some uh, spiritual teachers, you know, Siddha Yoga, the uh, people of the Benedictine uh, order, uh, some Zen Buddhists and so on. So all these things also work with people who had spontaneous uh, uh, episodes of what we call spiritual emergencies, but basically psychotic states with a lot of spiritual, uh, spiritual contact, content. Um, so I uh, published a, a number of books uh, about it because during this work there was uh, there were many challenging experiences and many challenging uh, observations. Uh, uh, quite a few of them could not be somehow interpreted in terms of the kind of training that I got in uh, medicine, in psychiatry, and in, in psychoanalysis. So I wrote books on the different aspects of these observations. And quite a few of them have been published by State University New York Press. And then um, about three years ago, I got a letter from them that we published several of your books would you consider writing one book in which you would kind of summarize the observations from this work and uh, specify somehow the conceptual challenges, the kinds of observations and experiences that cannot be accounted for 
in terms of the psychiatry and psychology that we have uh, in the West? And would you also suggest what kind of revisions would have to be made in uh, psychiatry and psychology to accommodate these kinds of experiences? Um, I was just approaching uh, 70 and uh, I told myself that I would sort of uh, at least partially retire uh, and pass the training to some other people. So we needed a, a manual for the training. And so this was a very welcome opportunity to get the manual for our training published by SUNY Press. So I wrote a book uh, and I gave it a kind of deliberately challenging title, uh, Psychology of the Future, expressing my really strong belief that if we systematically study the kind of observations and the experiences in these non-ordinary states, that it would radically change psychology and psychiatry to the extent that it would resemble what happened to physicists in the third decade, that we would somehow catch up with the change in the worldview that happened in quantum relativistic uh, physics and the kind of things that are outlined in what's, what has been called the new paradigm thinking. So this is uh, something that I would like to share with you. And I'm uh, uh, very well aware that it's going to be very provocative for, for uh, some of you. I have a, a less than an hour to communicate something that took me years to accept uh, when I was experiencing it and I was with people who were experiencing it. So those are really major, major uh, challenges, conceptual challenges. So I wouldn't expect that it, you know, it would be easily acceptable. But, uh, the exciting thing is that you're going to have uh, psilocybin research here, so you hopefully will observe some of the things uh, yourselves and you'll be able to, to say whether or not uh, you see it in a similar way. So I have studied non-ordinary states of consciousness. Uh, now the first problem was semantic. You know that in psychiatry, most psychiatrists today use the term altered states, which I cannot stand now after years of consciousness research. Uh, and I always have to think about uh, veterinary medicine when I hear it. Uh, you know, when you get your dog altered. So, because the, the idea is that uh, we should experience ourselves and the world in a particular way, and that these states are, uh, these altered states are kind of a distortion of what it should be. That they are kind of bastardized versions. Uh, uh, whereas I came to the conclusion that they are healing, they are transformative, they are uh, evolutionary, and um, um, you know, that they uh, open up dimensions of reality which are ontogenically, ontogenetically real or some kind of interesting, radically different perspective on everyday uh, reality. So we prefer, those of us who've done some uh, consciousness research prefer that term non-ordinary. But there's also a problem with that because that still covers a very large you know, what is non-ordinary state of consciousness? You can get drunk and certainly be in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. You might learn a lesson or two, but it's not going to be very healing or transformative or revealing. Uh, organic psych uh, psychosis, uh, trivial delirium, they're all, all non-ordinary altered states, but they are not the kind of category I was interested in. I was interested in the types of experiences that I ask you about when I ask the question, did you have any of those experiences? And I was just astounded that in psychiatry we don't have any special name for that category of experiences. We call them all altered states of consciousness. And basically seeing them in the, the category of pathology, not having any positive uh, use uh, for them. So I decided to give them a name and I call them holotropic. Uh, holos means whole and uh, uh, tropic is derived from trepane which means moving towards or being oriented towards. So it literally means moving toward wholeness or being oriented towards wholeness. Uh, now what uh, it would mean that we somehow are not whole the way we are. Uh, so the basic uh, idea behind this term is that we identify with just with fraction of who we are in the ordinary state of consciousness. Um, I usually uh, use a kind of Hindu shorthand uh, referring to the Upanishads when 
the question 